Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Mark. How are you today? I am amazing, Michael. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm amazing too. <laughs> and, and just before we press record, we were talking about Clubhouse, right? And just for a second there, your voice sounded like the founder of Clubhouse. Oh, did it? Was, was, I, yeah. was I doing something like this or something no. like this? <laughs> yeah, something like this. It, okay. Well, because when he comes on, he does his town halls and things. I don't know if you heard him yeah. speak. Well, he used to do, he, I don't know if this is still Sundays. Sundays at, at uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, I think, right? Yeah, something happens on a Sunday and a Wednesday, but I haven't been in to listen to them. But just for a second there, I went, oh, my God. I'm talking to the founder of Clubhouse. <laughs> <laughs> not quite, not quite. Not quite. Okay. But I'm sure you're the founder of something, which we're about to find out. So, Mark, um, to get us going into your story, I just asked this very simple question. Mark, please share us your story and how you got to where you are today. I love, I love that question because whenever I'm asked that question, it's like, what, where do you want to start? Uh, what, what version of the story? What version of me? What do we want to focus on? And I can't help but do that because at my heart, I'm a brand strategist and yeah. a positioning expert. And so mm -hmm. I can't help but want to give the audience the, the, the tailored version, the tailored story that focuses most on what they care about. Mm. And what I've realized only quite recently is this skill I have, again, to, to want to tailor the story exactly for the audience and show the version of me that will make the biggest impact. Yeah. It actually comes from my childhood. It actually comes from, uh, you know, growing up, uh, growing up when I was really young, my mom and dad separated uh, right around when I was born, so, but, but maintained a great relationship. And so I was growing up uh, with my mom and my aunt and my sister. And so I was raised by women basically uh, in a really pretty idyllic uh, household. My mom uh, was able to stay from home because she was an entrepreneur. Uh, she ran a, ran a clothing line. She had a children's fashion clothing line in the 80s uh, wow. before the, the big recession happened. And so I grew up listening to the sound of like shears on a board, you know, cutting, um, cutting fabric. And there used to be these bolts of fabric on, on racks. And I would like, I would connect um, our, our, um, our vacuum cleaner tubes so I could like talk in one end and listen to myself <laughs> in the other. Um, and I used to play under the, under the, she had this huge um, ping pong table she used as her like working table. And I used to play under there and, and the beach boys, you know, Kokomo would come on the AM radio and I would sing and dance with her. And we would go up to uh, the lake on weekends. And in the winter time, my grandparents, we would go visit them down in Florida. And it's really bizarre how amazing my childhood was. Uh, and then when I was seven, my mom remarried. And so, so I have this, this idyllic childhood uh, surrounded by love and with these great experiences. And my mom was an entrepreneur and my grandfather started a company in 1950 and built it into a, a really large privately held company. Right. So, so, I, so I was surrounded by these people who just did stuff and just made mm. stuff and, and lots of support and lots of love. And then when my mom remarried, what she, she didn't know at the time uh, was, that, was that my new stepfather had uh, some mental health issues, uh, was an alcoholic, and, um, and really hid this from mm. her quite mm. successfully. Wow. But, but now our house is a very different type of house. It's now my mom and my stepfather. Uh, my dad remarried at the same time. Suddenly, I'm the youngest with older step siblings on both sides who are six, seven years older than me. And our house changes. Um, you know, my, my stepfather uh, was, was manic. So he had the, the, the mania side of being bipolar without the depression side. But he meant he would go through these four, five, six week manic episodes. Um, lots of anger, lots of tension, mm. lots of mm. fighting. Um, lots of belittling. And so from kind of that seven or eight until I fam finally left the house at 16, uh, when I said, I can't do this anymore. I just, I can't live this way. I can't do this. I have to leave. Mm. Um, it was a very, looking back, it was only from the ages of what, like eight to 16, eight years, eight yeah. years. doesn't seem like that much. And yet as a at kid, that age, it, it is. Like, it's yeah. a lot. Yeah. It was a lot. And mm -hmm. when I, when I said like, Hey, I'm a brand strategist today. And what I, what I didn't realize at the time was I grew up in such a pressure cooker environment that I got very good 
at reading people. We right. got very good at telling people what they wanted to hear. Mm. And what I used to call like blending into the background, right? Like don't be seen, don't be heard, read the room, try not to do anything to disturb anyone, try not to stand out. And if you do stand out, say whatever you need to say to try and pacify them, to try and make sure that everything's okay, be on guard at all times. And, you know, this has led for me to have a lot of anxiety in my life, but yeah. our greatest weaknesses are also our greatest skills. It means that today I'm very good at reading the room, trying to get a sense of the tone, the environment, what needs to be said, how do we need to say it? How can we make a connection? Is it landing or isn't it landing? And um, yeah, that was learned in those, <laughs> those years of, of trying to dodge uh, people's anger. Well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? When you look back, when you were in that episode, eight-year episode, serial kind of, you know, trying to dodge bullets and figure people out, what mood is he going to be in today? Oh, look, he's in that mood. I can read the signs. It's those micro moments and you read the room, as you say. When you were right in it, it was not great. But when you look back on it, and because of the skills that you've developed, it's horrible to say, but it was a gift. It's the only way to look at it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, my friend Evan Carmichael um, and I, uh, we've known each other for like 15 years, and he was doing this, um, this workshop a number of years ago, maybe 2018 or 19. And he wanted us to dig into our most painful past. Mm -hmm. And it was when I started really considering these types of things, because up until you know, the last few years, I just kind of ignored it. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, there were other challenges we faced as well. My mom got really sick when I was in grade six um, from this surgery. Her leg got infected. She was required um, to like amputate part of it and have reconstructive surgery. But there was a six week period where she was in the hospital dying. And, yeah. um, you know, so um, just all of this craziness that kind of happened over the course of even a few years at the age of 11, 12, 13, even. Um, amongst these other things. Um, and it was only talking to Evan where Evan goes, where I start to dig into these things. And I realize that, that the hair on my arms start to stand up and I start to get goosebumps and my heart starts to race. And, and um, you know, my, um, I can feel in my temples, the blood moving a little bit, and I'm just getting more and more uncomfortable. And I go, why is that? Why, why, mm. why is, why is me thinking about these things or remembering myself, bringing myself back there so much that I'm having this physical reaction? Mm. And because I wasn't, like, frankly, because I wasn't physically abused ever, because I wasn't sexually abused, mm. because it was only um, verbal abuse and because it was only a really negative, toxic environment, I just, I knew other people had it way worse. Yeah. So I wouldn't allow myself to say that I grew up in an abusive home or an abusive environment, or I just wouldn't allow it. And if I didn't allow that, then there was no way to address it or think about it or consider it or even realize mm. that maybe this has served me in a really positive way. I got very good at seeing, at seeing um, all the things that, that were wrong and all the things that didn't work and all the ways that I wasn't living up or how I should be. I saw all the negatives. And it's only quite recently that I've realized that, that I know that your positives are negatives, right? Your greatest strengths are also your greatest weaknesses. Yeah. But only over the last year have I actually figured out that your greatest weaknesses are also your greatest strengths. Mm. And so it's very easy for us to move from strength to weakness because we're very good at being negative and beating ourselves up. Yeah. But if, but if strength to weakness is true, then your weaknesses are also strengths. You just need to find them. Yeah. 100%. And do you know what happened? You know when you're describing when you think back about those episodes and the hair of your body starts to stand up and your blood rushes and in your temples and your heart rate goes. Do you know where that's from in your body, in your brain? Uh, I imagine it's the it's the the little tiny part of your brain that's responsible for fight or flight, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the amygdala um, to give it its precise name. When you went through the stresses that you went into, you weren't in the jungle being chased by a tiger, right? But it could well have been. 
because it created the same amount of stress in your body at the time. So the verbal abuse, you know, the mental torture that you went through, um, the amygdala stores that program and goes, right, this episode, when it happens again, I will alert you and keep you safe. In order, and to keep you safe, I will put you into a stress mode, which is fight and flight. So your hairs on your body stand up, your temples of blood starts to pump, your heart rate goes up just by thinking about it. Because when you think about it, you activating that previous program in the amygdala and the amygdala goes, hold on a minute. He is in that situation or she is in that situation. Let's give him all the resources he needs right now to cope with it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's one of those, I imagine like, oh, I've seen this before. I know, I know what to do. I know what to do now. Let's go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so when you left at 16, how did that happen? Did you just pick up your suitcase and walk out of the door or did you finish some sort of education? Tell me about that. Um, I, 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 I was, I was very lucky. Um, but at the same time, so when I was, when I was just a little bit younger than that, so when I, I have a brother who's 11 years younger than me, a half brother and another who's 15 years younger than me, but when my, um, younger brother was born, so I guess I was 12 or 13. It's during that time. I was time on a lot of challenges during that time. Um, my younger brother was born. We left the house that we had grown up in, um, and moved into a small apartment cause we were going to move out into the country on a farm. Um, my mother got incredibly sick and, and almost passed away and, and was hospitalized. Um, and just a bunch of things, you know, my, my younger brother's learning how to walk and I used to videotape him every single day after school. So that way I could show my mom his first steps because my mom was in the hospital. Wow. And, um, and she just missed, she just missed all of that stuff. Um, so we were, we were, I was leaving the school I had grown up in. I had this younger brother. I had this family. My mom is incredibly sick. The same time, I, you know, slightly a little bit later, my grandfather gets sick and is hospitalized. Um, my stepfather, um, we're building this house in the country. He uh, falls off a ladder and breaks a whole bunch of his body. Um, the same week, my grand, my uncle is in a single car accident and almost killed. And whoa, um, I didn't realize. I didn't. I didn't listen. I never connected any of these dots. I, I I saw a therapist a few years ago, and he's asking about my background. I'm just going, oh, this happened, and then that happened, and this happened. And he's like, Mark, you're like. 12 or 13 like this seems like a lot to cope with and mm. it's like is it really was it a lot i don't, I don't know but <laughs> but i i remembered i remembered being a boy and not being able to live in that house yeah and i remember making the decision that was really hard that i that i was going to before all of kind of as this stuff's going on that 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 i want to go live with my dad my right. dad lived about 45 minutes away that, that even though I grew up with my mom, even though like I'm a child of, of a divorced house in the eighties where the mom always got the family, even though I much would rather stay with my mom, I'm going to go live with my dad, which means that I'm not going to be there for my little brother who I wanted to be there for. I have to turn mm. my back on all my friends. I, I won't mm. be able to see my family. I won't go up to the cottage for the summers. I won't go do these things. Like, like I got the courage to ask if I can move in with my dad, which meant turning my back on my entire life. And my mom and my dad came to some kind of agreement where they said, okay, Mark, you're going to go for the summer. You're going to go for four weeks on a trial. And this is what I recall, but they said, if it goes well, and if you're good, then you can move. You better believe I was the best behaved boy in the world. <laughs> I went to my dad's for a few weeks for the summertime. I am working so hard. I'm doing everything they say. I'm, I'm trying to do everything. And then I come home. And I'm like, so, you know, like I, I did the ask, I did everything that was asked of me. Like, mm. am I, am I going to be moving? I'm thinking I got to go to a different school. I got to do all these things. And my mom says, your dad never had any intention of you moving over there. So, mm -hmm. and I didn't realize that how much that like really hurt me. <laughs> like, I know this isn't therapy hour, but, but, but that. I, I only remembered this quite recently, this whole thing I had put away and I only remembered quite recently, but it also meant that when I was finally turning 16 and I was legally allowed to move out. Yeah. 
that's when I said to my mom, I can't live here anymore. And, and I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I just know I can't live here or I can't do this anymore. I like, I just, I can't, I'd spent too many years being too afraid of, um, you know, hurting myself, but maybe that's a way out or hurting someone else, but maybe that's a way out. And I just spent too many years not taking action. I was like, I, I got to live somewhere else. So I was fortunate in that my older sister was going to university. She decided not to go live on campus. She agreed that we could get a place together. And so I basically hitched my wagon to my sister. And when she left and got this little place with my mom's help and some of my dad's help and we kind of rearranged stuff. So child support came to us and I got a summer job and I would work and, and we like just, we were managed to both leave at the same time. She's 18. She's going off to university. She brought me with her. And let me tell you, my whole life after that changed. Um, I bet. <laughs> it was so much better being on your own. <laughs> <laughs> well, was it, or did you go, Oh, being an adult sucks. <laughs> oh. No, no. Oh. And, and so, and so here's, here's the thing, you know, they, Part of what made my childhood so stressful and hard was, was my stepdad would always say, we're not raising kids, we're raising young adults. We're not mm -hmm. raising kids, we're raising adults. And they gave us a ton of responsibility really, really early on. You know, when I was eight, when I was seven, I did the dishes. Okay, cool. Lots of people do the dishes. But by eight, I had to do my own laundry. Um, by nine, my mom would give us a spring and, a spring and um, fall allowance. And that was our allowance. We would get $200 every spring and fall. And that was for our clothing. That was for our bathroom essentials. That was for anything. If we wanted snacks, if we wanted food, um, other than like dinner time and, and like lunch goods, anything outside of that, we had to make those budgets work. Yeah. And, and so it's like, by the time it came time to move out, my sister and I were super frugal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we knew what we could get by with. We knew that we could manage our budgets. We had jobs and we worked really, really, really hard. Um, and, and because the pressure of trying to live in that environment was released, we actually just had more time to focus on friends or on, so, uh, on studies or like my grades went up when I left. Like, like just, just when you release the pressure and we see this in businesses, we see this in entrepreneurship and we see this with, with poverty, in fact. Like mm. when you release the pressure that's keeping you from, being you and, and doing your best, you are able to thrive in other areas of your life. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So did you, whilst you were living with your sister, continue college or education? Or did you go and just get a job? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I got a job uh, for summers and my aunt was the aunt that I grew up living with. She had, she lived in the city and she allowed me to stay at her place for the summer. And I got a job okay. working, working, doing ground maintenance at my grandfather's company. And um, so I would work all summers uh, and I would earn enough money to kind of carry me through the winter, but I finished high school. You know, I moved out at the end yeah. of grade 10, which is considered a kind of the um, sophomore year. So I still had grade 11. I still had grade 12. And then when I was going to school, we had a fifth year, uh, which was our prerequisites for university or college. Mm. Um, and so I, I, finished, I finished my schooling. Um, during the same period, I met my wife. You know, I was 17. She was 16 when we started dating uh, in 2000. So <laughs> we're, we're, you know, we've been married 17 going on 18 years. We've been together 22 going on 23 years. Great. Um, but uh, we met each other because she lived down the street from this new little house that my sister and I were living in. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I, I went to film school. I, um, I, I went to film school and in, in the city and my wife picked a university close so we could stay together. And uh, it was a really quick technical course because I was in a hurry to get on with life. You know, part of this childhood mm -hmm. and part of moving it at 16, part of meeting my wife the next year, um, even though we were dating, was like we were ready to be grownups. We were ready yeah. to be adults. We actually skipped a few steps, I realize now looking back. But mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, we were married. I, I was done school by the time I was 20. Um, mm. and I was working my wife and I got married in 2005. So I was 22. She was 21. We had my first daughter 23. And the same year we started the agency that I run today, Phantom Media. So just before we get into that, why film school? You kind of dropped that in. i went and did <laughs> film school. Why did you go to film school? Because I got really scared, and it seemed easier, honestly. Um, 
So I, I grew up in a construction family, a family of developers and, and construction. And as I mentioned, mm. like around people who could just build anything and do anything. Yeah. And I always wanted to be an architect. And right. so I had this dream of being an architect. And when I was a kid, I used to grab chart paper and I would like make floor plans. And I used to play with my Lego and think how cool it would be to be able to build a house to scale with like staircases and things like that. And I just, I love, I still do. I love space. I love architecture. I love, I love all of those things. Hmm. And as I went through high school, I had a very easy story to tell people like, I'm going to be, I'm going to become a civil engineer and then an architect. I'm going to become yeah. a civil engineer and an architect, right? I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to engineering school and I'm going to become an hmm. architect. And yeah. it was a very safe thing for everyone in my family, a family of builders. They're like, great, Mark's going to go into the family business. And everyone loved it and everyone supported me. And, uh, and you told you know, them what they wanted to hear. And what I really wanted to do though, but, yeah. um, but I didn't realize I had really poor study habits. So right. I'm fairly certain now looking back that I had ADHD that I wasn't aware of. Um, I had this anxiety um, and I, I tested really well because I have a very good, at least at the time I had a very good memory. Right. And so if I can conceptualize something quickly and I can learn quickly and I've got a good memory, you can test really well without actually ever learning anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I hit, I hit a course. I hit, I hit college or university chemistry. <laughs> I could not wrap my mind around this. I was good with physics. I was good with math. I was good with English. I was good with communications. I was good with everything. I could not. And, I'm, and, and I wasn't doing terribly, but I was getting like a low 60s in chemistry when I was used to kind of getting a high 80s or 90s. I was like an mm. honor roll kind of dean's list student. Frankly, my wife would get mad because she said I didn't try, but I just tried at the areas that mattered, <laughs> which is prep for the test. If the test is the only thing that matters, you don't have to do anything else. Um, but these terrible study habits meant I was struggling in chemistry. And I thought, if I can't do chemistry, how, can, how will I do algebra geometry? And how will I do you know, all, uh, all of these other things? And can I do it? And will I do it? And will I succeed or not? And, um, and frankly, I was taking this, this film course and because I had, growing up as a kid, I had filmed so much stuff for my mom. Oh, uh, right? yes. My mom was sick and I was yes. filming all these things. And yes. uh, I used to be the AV guy in, 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 when I was really young who would get the projector. When I was a kid, right. we still had projectors and I would feed the 16 millimeter film through the projector. And yeah. uh, I used to play with microphones and, and cameras and all of this stuff. So I'm, right. taking, this, I'm taking this course, this, this film course where we just got to make a movie. Like it was just right. like, make a movie. And I was like, what does that sounds like so much more fun, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Than, than chemistry and engineering and all this other stuff. So I go, I'm going to go to film school. Right. I always right. had this passion for it. I always filmed stuff. I always liked it. I'm going to go to film school. And, uh, Fantastic. and so I, I tell my mom and my mom's like, well, okay, that's a big change. But you know what, Mark, go to film school. And my mom was amazing at this. And she still is. She was like, listen, go to film school and do it. And if you don't like it, or if it doesn't work for you, or you mm. don't want to do it anymore, mm. stop, stop. Yeah, Because no one can take your education away from you. No one can take your experiences away from you. And you have time later to go back if you want, or to change, yeah. or to do something. Yeah. You, have, you have time to do something else. Just try it. And so the biggest challenge was actually me telling my grandmother and my grandfather that I didn't want to go to engineering school. I didn't want to mm. become an architect, that I'm going to go to film school. And my grandmother was really upset. Um, she was really upset, actually. And she, she wow. even, I remember the moment she was like, she said, well, she, I said, this is what I'm doing. She argued with me. I said, well, I'm doing it. And she said, well, you're young enough that when you fail, you can do something better. So, something like that. I remember that when you're young enough, you're young enough that when you fail, dot, dot, dot. Um, mm. But I went to film school. And you know what? That engineering mind, that architect mind, that mind who likes environment and who likes tone. And when you pair that over with the fact I can read a room and I'm really good at trying to figure out what people need to hear and say and all that stuff. Like when you start to bring all the little different versions of you together, um, and this is what I tell my kids. This is what I tell entrepreneurs and people just starting out. There's no wasted experience. Mm. Right? You're going to bring, you're gonna bring the, the weird collage of everything that makes you you to what you do. And when you start to lean into doing it your way and you, and you pair that with experience and hard lessons learned and other things, you're going to come up with this really remarkable, amazing, unique way to approach things. Mm. And so when I got to film school, I was not the most creative. 
which bothered me. I didn't want to be a director and everyone wanted to be a director. Yeah. Um, I was, I, I focused more on studies and grades, not realizing that network and practical was actually more important. Um, yeah. So, so that was film school. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, super interesting. And was what, what kind of period of the dot com development did you go to film school? So YouTube was already out by then. No, no, no. So I, I went right. to film school in, so I graduated high school right when the dot com bubble burst. Right. Um, and my, I had been, I had been saving for schooling and a bunch of other things. And so, mm. um, I went right when the dot com. So, so I went to film school when we were still shooting stuff on tape and 16 millimeter camera. Right. Um, where I remember sitting in class and trying to learn what HD was. Like, do you remember how, how TVs used to be like a rectangle, like four by three, yeah. technically? Yes. Yes. And then, and then I remember watching the first, the first widescreen thing I ever saw was, was my older stepbrother had a collector's edition of star wars letterboxed it was vhs yes. tape star wars letterbox it was this collector's edition and i remember him putting it on and me being like why are there those bars at the top and bottom he said this is so you can see the entire film mm. and i was like but it's stupid everything's so small because yeah. we were watching things on like 19 inch tvs or 13 inch tvs back then right like like i remember my mom had a big screen tv it was 24 inches, I think. It was like, mm. so anyway, I went to film school in the era where we shot on tape. We had just started to bring in like a nonlinear, like computer editing. Uh, we were digitizing stuff still. And we were trying to learn what this HD thing was because mm. Mm. TVs were still rectangle. Uh, and, and so it wasn't, uh, frankly, I think YouTube started to really break in 2006. Um, Google bought YouTube in 2007, in February mm. of 2007. And I already started my agency at that point. I'd been through right. film school. I'd worked in television. I worked in live events. And I'd worked for a year and a half at an internet marketing franchise before internet video was even really a thing that we could do well. Mm. Mm. Brilliant. Okay. Okay. So film school... HD, and then you already gave us a bit of an insight as to what happened next then. So continue, <laughs> please. Well, I just have to ask, does anyone find this that interesting? <laughs> and this well, is why I ask. I was talking to my team about this. This is my life. It just seems so plain and ordinary, doesn't it? <laughs> well, you know, um, first of all, I always say, I like to help people tell a better story about themselves in business, which hopefully you do too. And essentially, we all live the same story. But people, places, events, uh, situations, life stuff happens. But essentially, we, we get born, we, we meet our parents, our siblings, we go to we learn to walk and speak we go to school education we have to find a job make a living do a job you know we get into the autumn and winter of our lives we get sick we perish maybe it happens all again we don't know you know so we have essentially got the same story but what's different are the people places events and situations that are opportunities for us to learn from somebody else's story and what has happened in their life. Because what happens is, like in the movies, we go, ah, oh, that store Star Wars movie, Luke Skywalker, he's just like me. I've gone through that too. Although, okay, I don't have a lightsaber and I don't fly in these beautiful aircraft, but the story is what we get inspired by and we kind of go here's mark he's luke skywalker he's gone through all of these things and he's still standing at the end of it and it kind of goes if he if mark can do it he looks an okay kind of guy that means i could do it i can run my own business even though i've had a shitty upbringing a sh you know 
a horrible situation with teachers, parents, whatever, and other stuff that happens in our lives, but I can still make it. And that's why we want to hear the story. And that's why it's still, yes, it is interesting. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that. And I mean, it's interesting because we often think that that we're the heroes coming in to help other people, but, but mm. you know, everyone's the, everyone's the hero of their own story, right. their own journey. And, um, and you, you know, what's interesting about a format like this, or even a conversation like this is, is it, is it can't truly capture the high highs and the low lows. No, it, it also can't capture how insignificant some things are that feel tremendously significant at the time. Yeah. And how, life-changing other things are that just kind of slip right by you and you don't mm. even realize until you look back um and part of what what i try to do because because i do struggle more with I, I tend to be very reflective and i get sentimental and i get depressed and all of those things um that comes with with looking back um but when i look forward i, I get anxious and i get worried and i get concerned and all of those other things uh, and so what I, what I try to do, though, is I, I try to remember that, like, hey, remember those things that you thought were, were life-shattering? That, mm. you know, you're still standing today. You're still okay. You still have the home. You still That's have the it. family. You still have your health. You still have these things. You got through them, and you thought it was the end of the world, and it's really um, not a big deal. You know, what I, tell, what I tell my friends when they're facing those situations is that there's, there's a po- and I tell myself even, there's a possibility that in five years you won't even remember this. No. Like, like either big things will happen, exciting things will happen, challenges will happen. There's a possibility that, that what you're facing right now won't even be a blip on the radar of the story that you tell. That's right. Um, that's right. And so that's, that's more why, why I was asking, though, as well, because, because I think that mm-hmm. for me, it's much more interesting uh, to focus on, on the feelings and the lessons of key moments. But um, uh, yeah, so, so I mean, a huge shift for me was when I was 23, uh, so I mentioned that my wife and I got married young, Yeah. that uh, in 2006, I decided I wanted to start my own company. I'd been thinking about it for a few years. And uh, I, I, I found notes of actually me at like 19 or me at 21, um, like with like handwritten notes of like, oh, I could maybe become a realtor, a uh, real estate agent, or maybe mm-hmm. I could um, maybe I could, uh, you know, start a video company because I went to film school. or Maybe I could become yes. a photographer, or just like these different things. Um, at one point I thought maybe I could become a mechanic because they seem to make good money right away. And it was just like, Mm. I was so interested in (laughs) making a little bit more money to get by. Um, and, and what's funny is there's this time where I left film school and I worked, I worked in television free, uh, freelancing and volunteering. So an internship and, and freelancing, I got engaged to my wife. We got married. And in that year and a half, um, I didn't really actually do any that much related to to why I went to film school. I went to film school because I wanted to be a video editor. I wanted to be Mm. a documentary, a documentarian. I wanted to be a storyteller. And I find myself out of school for like a year and a half, and I'm not really doing any of that stuff. Mm. And I remember this moment where I thought, I've wasted my life. Like, like, like I'm a year and a half out of school. And why did I go to school? I didn't even use any of this stuff. I'm not using it today. Oh my Mm. goodness. I'm wasting my life. I told, I told someone this kind of like weird feeling um, that it's like, how could I be out of school for this long and not be doing anything? And I told, I told the manager at the job I was at who we became friends and he found a job posting for this in-house video producer. And he said, you should apply. I said, well, I don't have any, I don't have any of, I don't have any of the experience. I want five years experience. He's like, oh, they always say that. I don't know how to use any of these tools. He said, oh, you can learn how to use those tools. I, I don't have a resume. It's not very good. He said, I'll help you write your resume. Uh, okay, I guess I don't have any excuses. <laughs> so he helped me write my resume. He had found the job posting. He submitted it for me. And I went through this interview process and I ended up getting the job. Um, and, and the reason why I, I bring up this part of the story was because when I was in that year, year and a half of quote unquote, wasting my life, not, you know, not doing, I went to film school to make films and I'm not even making videos and I'm not editing and I'm not doing anything and I'm going nowhere. Um, like that never happened to me again. 
<laughs> no, <laughs> because good. I went ed- for this job for a year and a half and I made videos and then I started a video agency and then I've spent the last 16 years around videos. And it's like, it's so funny to me that I've spent basically now almost 20 years doing the thing I went to school for in some capacity or some way. But when I was in that moment in between, which again is this little blip on the radar, it felt like I had thrown my life away. <laughs> it felt like I had wasted so much time. Has that ever happened to you? Where you yeah, feel oh, away yeah. and then and then you yeah. realize like, oh, this is like this is like barely even a page on the chapter on the of story That's of right. my life. It's only one sentence in the chapter. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So so when I was 23, uh, my wife and I had our, our daughter. I had been working at this internet marketing franchise, this job, this video production job that my old manager had helped me get. Yeah. And I had learned so much. Um, you know, it was, it was 2005, 2006 internet marketing franchise. So uh, I learned about franchising. I learned about mm. business. Mm. Um, my internal clients, because, because I didn't make any videos for anyone outside. I made the videos for like the company. I was internal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But my internal clients were all the C-suite people. So the founder and the board members and the CEO and the CFO and the CMO. And, and at 23, 22, 23, um, frankly, not, not really knowing a lot, trying really hard, trying not to embarrass myself, but soaking everything in. I learned so much about business. I learned about entrepreneurship. I learned about live events and I learned about um, effective communications and um, what segmentation was and split testing and, and just all the foundational elements of marketing and communications um, in an environment where, frankly, I could make mistakes and hide them because no one really knew what I did. Mm. I didn't, like, I reported, I was the guy making all the videos and the assets, and I reported to the head of HR because wow. technically I was in, I was in a, like, non-marketing role because I was technically in a communication, like, it was so bizarre. And, and so my, I didn't sit with any other team members my age. I sat like in, I sat with legal and regulatory and finance in the C-suite locked up area of my department. So every day I'm talking with the CEO and I would go in and have coffee with him and like just all of this bizarre stuff. Um, but, but looking back and the a recommendation I'd have for anyone who wants to do anything at any age, it's just like, Get into an environment where, I mean, you have no ego. You want to work really hard. You want to try really hard. But, but get into an environment where you're surrounded by, uh, by great people who are doing great things and, and hopefully where you can make mistakes and hide them and make mistakes on someone else's dime. I would say that yes. too, right? Like, yes. like where you don't have to pay out of pocket for the mistakes you make. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That, incredible. That's a great story. And the thing is, there was a reason why you were in the C-suite uh, doing all that networking and, you know, learning your knowledge and, you know, developing a muscle around entrepreneurship and business, which obviously gave you the courage to go it alone. Correct? A hundred percent. And yeah. and so I, um, a, a few things I watched because... One of the greatest parts of a role that I had was that it was my job to make videos for every department of the company. Right. So think about um, training or franchise development marketing or communications Hmm. or um, internal, internal, what we call knowledge management or um, franchisee onboarding or, you know, just like department after department, video after video. But, but here was what was great about my job. One, I had to try and understand what we were making before we made it. Yeah. And then I would go to all the conferences. I would fly in and I would film everything. I filmed all of the videos for all of the departments. And then I was responsible for editing them. So I would get these hours of footage and I would sit there for a week or two. And if I didn't understand what was being said, how would anyone watching understand what was being said? Yes, yes. And so I remember them flying in this, um, this executive sales trainer who did a five-day training that I had to record. So I had, I don't know, it was 40, 45 hours of footage that I had to turn into a series. I, I not only sat in on the training that people paid a lot of money to be a part of so I could film it, but then over the course of the next few months, I had to, I had to watch it time and time and time again. You better believe that just being absorbed in this world, and, and this is like such a great secret for anyone who's in communications, marketing, or what have you, is, is you get pulled into, this, into these different industries, these different verticals, these different roles, 
But what I didn't realize at the time was it was the greatest college or university I could have ever had. Yeah. Because as we were trying to teach people internet marketing and marketing and segmentation and communications and all of those, and we're trying to teach them about finance and how to be entrepreneurs and how to run a business, and we're teaching them about sales and everything else. I just spent a year and a half absorbing all this information. Yeah. And and all of the tools and all of the tricks. And so one, I wish I had stayed longer, but at the time I felt like I learned everything I wanted to learn. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm a classic <laughs> millennial. Uh, yeah. And so a year and a half in, I, my daughter, my daughter, first daughter who's 16 now, she was born. My wife wasn't working. We were struggling to get by because we were living, you know, we live in Toronto, which is a very high cost of living area. Uh, my wife wasn't working and, and my daughter was just born. I'm earning like 45 grand a year. Um, and so I thought, you know what? I always wanted to start my own company. And the pitch to my wife was, hun, I think I, I, think I could do what I do for, for this one company. I think I could do it for like lots of companies. Mm. And if I do this for, as opposed to for one for 10, here was the pitch, ready? Think about how much money we're going to make. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's not how it went, in, in fact. But that was the pitch. And my wife was, I had to really convince her and tell her I wanted to do this. And she reluctantly agreed. And so I approached the CEO, who I'd become friends with, who mm. I'd spent all this time with. And I gave him a pitch. And I said this, listen, you have me making all of these videos. And we've gone from me over the last year and a half, we've brought in new equipment. We've brought in, we've made it even more productive. You've, you've had me hire another salesperson who report, or another, sorry, production person who reports to me. I said, this is going to just keep scaling and scaling and scaling. This is going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know why? Because as long as I'm internal, people are going to keep asking for stuff that's not important. Yeah. We start a project, it gets canceled halfway through. Someone in one department says, Mark, I need you on this. I say, I can't. I'm working for someone else in another department. And, and I don't know, who's, who's the one who's going to argue which one's more important? There's no yeah. structure. There's no internal budgets. There's, there's no way to determine whether the work we're doing even matters. Yeah. And so let me leave. Let me take the equipment with me and outsource the work to me. I will come off your books. I will no longer be a fixed expense. And it will bring structure to these different departments because now they have to spend money on it. You are, yes. in fact, going to value the work more. And he said, Mark, I love that idea. <laughs> I love it. I will let you take the equipment and you can do work in exchange. So we took the equipment for free. I left the company with my very first client, this client who was going to outsource all this work. We had worked on a six month projection. So I had guaranteed revenue mm. and I felt so confident leaving that I had the courage to do so. Now, here's the thing. Here's, here's, here's the, the, the thing that I didn't anticipate. I brought so much structure and suddenly now I have an internal client who's, an, who's now not an internal client who's used to not having to pay anything for the work I did. Yeah. And remember how I said like, hey, I'm going to bring structure and you're going to start to value the work now because they have to pay for it. Mm. They decided they didn't want to pay for anything. And, right. and even though the CEO said, Mark, this sounds great. Yeah, we do have all this work. Let's go. As soon as I went to the department heads, they went, I'm not spending money on this. I don't have budget uh, for this. Yeah. And we didn't do, like, we, we barely did anything. Three months in, my, my first client, my only client that I was really working with, I, I had only walked away with seven grand worth of work. We anticipated in the first three weeks that would be written off. Three months in, we had done like $1,500 in work. And I went back to him and I'm like, none of your teams are doing anything. And I, 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 don't, I can't even pay off this gear that we have. And we're using all our cash and we're going to be bankrupt in three months. And he was very understanding and he was very nice. And he tried to like, he, uh, he tried to like dust up a little bit of work for me and lean on his team and whatnot and give them, get some budget. But mostly he just went, you know what, Mark, we'll just forgive you for the gear. Um, and we'll just, we'll just forgive you for the gear. I, I know we didn't, we, we planned on this going better. So, so even then it kind of worked out, but by May, I, 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 I realized I only have three months left. I'm about to go bankrupt and I don't know how to sell. I don't know what I'm doing. Everyone ask, is asking me, how's it going? And, and I am telling them, great. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, oh, Mark, you know, how's it going? Awesome. Things, <laughs> things, things are amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, this, this whole like stepping out on my own, best decision I ever made. Yeah, no, no, things are, things are great. I would go to work because I rented an office. I would go to work and I would just sit there. Like I would, I, I was like trying to email people, trying to cold call people, 
My wife would see me go to work. She'd see me come home. I was quote unquote working. I had nothing to do. Like mm-hmm. it was not going well, but am I going to admit to my wife where, you know, we have now like a five month old daughter. Am I going to admit to her it's not going well? Am I going to tell the clients who I want to, I want to be able to impress enough that they'd hire me that, that it's not going well? Do I want to tell the my people in my friends and family who are like, Mark, wow, you have the courage to do what I could never do. Wow. You're so brave. Wow. You're so strong. <laughs> it's not going well. Like, like, no, no. How's it going? Awesome. <laughs> But I learned, and I'm so happy I did. Yeah. I admitted to someone it wasn't going well. And I, I don't even remember who. Like, I don't even remember who. But I know that there was somebody, and it may have been the CEO of the company, where I was just like, it's just, I just don't know what to say. And part of the problem was I had started my company. I, when I was at this internet marketing franchise, I made videos. Yeah. And when I started my company, I was a video production company. Yeah, And I was used to working with people who saw the value of video and wanted videos. And so when I started, I was like, I make videos. Who needs a video? Anyone need a video? You need a video? You need a video? Who needs a video? I make videos. Get your <laughs> videos here. Right? Like, that was me. And people would be like, again, this is 2006, 2007. YouTube was just barely a thing. One minute videos were out. We had to put things on streaming servers as Flash because that didn't exist. The iPhone hadn't been launched or invented yet. Twitter wasn't a thing yet. Facebook was just starting out. Yeah. People are like, no, we don't need videos. <laughs> but you know who needed videos? Big, big companies needed videos, but big, big companies weren't going to turn to Mark no. at 23 without a good brand, without a good front, without being able to sell anything with no advertising, with no marketing, with no team. They weren't going to turn to me. And so I, I admitted to someone, I don't remember who, I don't know what I'm doing. This is not going well. And in a few months, we're going to run out of money. And he said, you know what, Mark? When you left this company, some, someone else also left at the same time. Really great sales guy. The guy was heading up our franchise development marketing team. And I think he's a business coach now. You should reach out to him. And so I reached out to this man, Frank Milner. And we got together for coffee. And you got to remember that I'm 23. I'm five months in. I have no money. I have no revenue. Um, we're, we're scraping to get by. That first year... That first year, my household income was $18,000. Mm. It was so low that, that the government put us on social assistance. That's how little money we made. We were living, the poverty line at the time was 30 grand in my savings. Yeah. We were at 18 grand. And it wasn't like I had a ton of savings. I hadn't figured this out. Again, my, my pitch to my wife was, we're going to make so much money. So <laughs> oh man, I, I remember Frank Milner meeting with me for coffee. And I just go like, this is what I do. This is what I want to do. Like, I just, I don't know what I'm doing. And, um, and I'm just Mark and I'm small and I have no cash and you're Mm. awesome. And I don't know why you'd want to help me. Mm. Right. Like just all that inferiority, you know, how how people don't want to reach out for help because you're worried that I'm not, maybe not big enough to be helped. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, well, let me, uh, let me think about this. And he came back to me a week later and he said, you know what, Mark, um, here's what I want to do for you. I'm going to be your business coach. This was such a generous offer. I don't even realize at the time because this man was, was in his, uh, I guess, mid to late forties. Um, so a good 20 years ahead of me. He was the head of sales for Aramark, uh, a large food company. And he had done a lot of things and had a lot of experience. And he said, I am going to meet with you weekly. Weekly, he's going to drive to my offices. He's going to meet with me for two hours every week. I think it was $500 a month. Wow. And 10% of revenue. Right. Now I'm going like, I don't know if I can afford $6,000 a year. The revenue, it's like, whatever. I don't care about the revenue, man. There's, there's no revenue to be had. 10% 10 of of nothing is nothing. (laughs) Exactly. No big deal. Um, And I remember pondering it. Like, can I afford this? And should I spend $500? And like, if he came to me today, I'd be like, done, 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 done. Come, come. I'm like, yeah, no problem. Yeah. I hired business coaches later. I'm paying like three, four grand, five grand a month for them. Like, like, like this is, this is what was so amazing. And what Frank helped me figure out is what I help people figure out today. Right. What makes you unique? How can you help people? You might have a product or a service or a message or a skill set. I had a craft. I made videos. Yes. But it doesn't mean that people go like, 
I want a video, right? They, they, want, they want an outcome. Mm. And he helped me realize that, that I have to tailor my message depending on who I'm speaking with, what their objectives are. All those things I actually learned when I was working at this internet marketing franchise about making effective communications. Yes. I could easily just apply as opposed to like, will I make the video effective? Will I make the conversation effective? Will I connect with the prospect? Am I understanding what their expectations are? Can I deliver on those expectations? Can I focus on outcome? If I'm speaking to someone in HR, how is that different than someone in, you know, Marcom or a CEO or an entrepreneur or pre-startup or whatever? Like, can I yes. change what I say to be able to say like, hey, you have this want, need, or desire. I think I can help you solve that by doing A, B, C, D. And can I, can I customize that in real time? And as it turns out, as soon as he helped me realize that the, all of the stuff I had learned on making really effective communications and videos could just be applied on this side, it was like, oh, oh, okay. And, and then within the next few months, we like did 100 grand in revenue. Um, and, and, and then the next year, we were able to get to like 180 or something. Um, and we had, it was, it was you know, not great work. It was, you know, I was still just me. I didn't have any office furniture. I was using, I had bought these secondhand banquet tables from a hotel. Um, you know, the printer was still on the floor. Uh, we were scraping to get by, but, but we had established enough with Frank Milner's help. I had established enough of a business. People knew I was a video guy. I started to figure out sales. I still have my very first proposal that I keep in my closet here because it's laughable. It's laughable what it was, but you know what? If you have conversations you can have with people and if you can get out there and if you can learn from your mistakes and really you can just get enough volume in, you can get really good at stuff really, really quickly. Um, and so I was able to do that and, and we built a pretty solid little business until that great recession came along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it well. <laughs> 2007. In fact, Lehman Brothers went pop on my birthday in 2007. 2008, right? So that 2008, been, 2008. Yeah, that would have been what, September 2008? 15th of September. Yeah. On my birthday, they went pop. Guess, guess what? So 15th of September 2008, mm. they go pop. Guess when we were expecting our second child and my wife insisted we have to buy a house? On the 15th That's, of September. <laughs> about six months before that. Oh, okay. May of 2008, we buy our first house. Oh, wow. We closed in uh, July 31st. My son was born August 31st, mm. 2008. So now we have this okay little business, but now I have a mortgage. Yeah. And we got a house and we're having my second child. And the recession, you know, things are going a little bit crazy. Things are going a little yeah. bit weird. Yeah. And so by January and February, I had one team member, one, one junior team member being paid minimum wage. Um, I had used up all the money we had in the bank. I had to let her go. We were working with a lot of big corporate clients on internal communication, so banks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were working with a lot of banks and financial institutions and pension plans. Some reasons, somehow we got, we got worked into there. And uh, January and February, we had no projects. We had no work. And I remember in February of 2009, I remember calling my mom one day and saying, like, I don't have anything to show for the last few years of effort and work. And so 2009, I'm now 26. Uh, my wife and I have two kids. I have four today, but we had two kids at the time. We had the house. But it's, it's not like I had a, a, an amazing portfolio. Mm. And it's not like I really at the time even understood or respected the experience I had. All I saw was that my friends had all gone out and gotten traditional jobs. Yeah. And in 23, 24, 25, 26, they went from me being ahead because I was young and I was ahead to me being behind. Mm. Right. I had, I had less income. I had less money. I was more, I mean, it was 2009. We had no work. It, no. It, everything was unstable. And I said, like, I just, I just feel like this isn't working. And uh, my mom said, well, stop. Like, like, stop. Back mm. to that advice at film school, right? No one can take your experience away from you. No one can take your yeah. education away from you. Do it until it, it works. Like, if it stops working for you, stop doing it. Yeah. And I was like, but I just don't feel like I actually did it. I feel like I tried it. 
Mm. I feel like I was trying to figure things out, but I don't actually feel like I could, I could stop now and look back and be like, yep, I got like, I, 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 I was an entrepreneur. I was a small business owner. I was successful. And I was like, I just, I don't feel like I can stop because I just, I've sacrificed. It's, it's the, the fallacy of sunken costs, right? Mm. I've mm. put too much into this to walk away now. Yeah. And so I said, I, I need, I'm going to give it one last kick at the can. And my mom was like, well, what do you need to do? And I was like, I think I need to hire a salesperson to help me figure out sales. Yeah. And she, how do you do that? I, I don't know. Through my network, I think I know a headhunter. How much does that cost? So I went out and fr- off of my mortgage, I borrowed $50,000. Mm. So now not only do we have no work and we've used up all our cash and I have a mortgage, I pulled 50 grand um, off, of, off of the house as well. And, uh, and, and I went out and hired a headhunter and he hired me a salesperson. And I was like, finally, someone to help me figure out sales, figure out the messaging, figure this stuff out. And he starts calling people and he starts setting up meetings and we start to see some traction. And then six weeks in, he quits. <laughs> and it's like, oh, and see, here's the thing. It's like, I, I have no money. And so like those six weeks, it's like I, I had already spent $7,200 paying his, his like base pay, never mind commission. And now there's, and now he quits. And so it's like, okay, so now I don't have 50 grand and, and I now have 41,000, whatever it is, right? 42,500, 42,800, whatever it is. I got to go back to the headhunter. We need another salesperson. And a guy comes in named Daniel Moskowitz. And I don't know what he saw in me. Um, because frankly, if I look back, I, I was a bit, I, I looked like a train wreck. I was a bit of a joke, but he must've seen something. He must've seen a hunger or a desire or something, or maybe he was just really desperate for work, but he took it. I feel like he took a shot on me. I don't feel like I took a shot on him. He had mm. many, many years of executive sales experience. He had sold millions of dollars of stuff. And he helped me realize that, that my, that despite the fact that Frank Milner, my business coach had helped me figure some stuff out, we still didn't have a good brand. We still didn't have good marketing. We still weren't clear on who we're targeting. We had no lead generations. We weren't investing in, in any advertising or any of those things. So I had no money. And so for the next six months, I paid Daniel and I didn't pay myself. Right. So I would take each paycheck. I would, I would, I would, I would have my, my controller process the paycheck and pay the taxes on it, but I would slip the paycheck into my desk and I wouldn't cash it. Because what's the point of taking money out of one account that has no money and moving it into another account, <laughs> right? Like it's all, it's all my money. Um, yes. At the end of the day, I still have to pay back this $50,000 loan that's off my house. And so I don't, and this wasn't a long-term plan, but it was just like, okay, I just, you know what? I'm going to pay Daniel. I can't use my cash up too much. I'm not going to do this. And so I wouldn't deposit. And my wife came home and she's like, Mark, there's, there's no paycheck. I know. I just, I just don't, we just don't money. And then two weeks, you know, and then like the, then, then the second pay goes through. It doesn't, you know, I don't deposit it. And then the second month and then the third month, she's like, Mark, are you going to, are you going to pay yourself? Because there's, there's no money. There's no money. I'm paying Daniel. I'm paying rent. We're starting to do advertising now. There's no money. Mm. And then the fourth month and then the fifth month. And I didn't pay myself. I didn't, I didn't ever, even throughout that year, I didn't cash any of those checks. I just wrote it off as a shareholder loan but it was six months before I started paying myself a very small base pay. And it was that long because that's how long it took for me and Daniel to figure out how to get our first sale. Right. With him. And it was like 14 grand um, or, or 20 grand or something. And, and that is really, when I said to my mom, like, ah, I just can't give up now in February, 2009, I got to give it one last kick at the can. Mm. It took to the end of, end of 2009 for us to start to figure stuff out and for the market to start to turn around. And we got through. And then, right. and then through 2010, we started selling more. We brought on another, sale, another team member. And then, and then by June, we brought on a full-time producer. And by the end of that, that next year, we were at like 300 grand revenue. And then from 300 to 650, from 650 to 950, from 950 to a little over a million. And, and then suddenly within like three or four years, everything seemed to change. And it's, it's really weird because in those first few years, those first three or four years, I felt like I was making no progress. I felt like I was behind. I felt like I was throwing my life away, just like that gap between film school. Yes. It felt like no matter what I did, it was never going to work. Mm. And then suddenly it seemed to start working. Mm. 
And then, and then it, everything turned around. Everything just suddenly like, like, yeah, selling a million dollars a year just doesn't seem that hard. Got great <laughs> team, got great systems, got great work. And, and I don't know how, if I could have shrunk that or could have made that faster, but I know that I, that I couldn't be ready for the growth without figuring out all the mistakes first. Yeah. I just wish it would have been easier and I wish it would have yeah. been faster. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I hear from all of that journey, and thank you so much for sharing so openly and, and frankly about, you know, your journey and all the detail. And it's, it is, in some ways, it's heartwarming to, to know that other people that are trying to build businesses go through stuff that isn't easy. But for me, I just saw three words kind of in front of me in my brain. And that said, never give up. <laughs> <laughs> Never give up mm. and ask for help. Yeah. Those, it, it, I, you know, my business coach, when we started, he said, Mark, you're kind of a likable guy. And I think if you were just more honest with people, they'd want to help you. Mm -hmm. And so he had me take these bankers out for lunch. He even told me what to say. He said, like, this is so uncomfortable for me. He said, Mark, you need to take these bankers out for lunch that you kind of know through someone and say, I'm 23 years old. I just got married. I have my first daughter. I started my business six months ago. It's not going well. And we don't, I just want to do good work. Yeah. I just want to do good work. I just want to help people. Mm. Do you think there's anyone in your department or your company who you can connect me with who might need my help? Let me tell you, that was like from, from a six months earlier being like, everything's fine. Everything's great. Like <laughs> the thought of taking someone out for lunch and saying, mm. I'm 23 years old. I just got married. I just have my kids. We, like, blah, 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 like things aren't going well. I just want to do good work. Do you think there's anyone you can connect me with who, who might need some work done? And they were like, oh, um, uh, yeah, sure. They connected me with a guy named Greg Skinner. And we did this like one really small project, but it's funny because for something like the first 12 years, uh, like a Phantom Media, he was my longest term client. Like that one lunch led to, it, I, at one point I added it up and it was something like four or $500,000 worth of work came from like that one lunch. But that doesn't even account for me leveraging this relationship to that one or this portfolio piece to that portfolio piece or what have you. And so we should take a lot of comfort in the fact that, as you said, if you don't give up, so as mm -hmm. a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as a creative, as a leader, if you don't give up, then it's never going to end. And that's, and that's awesome, right? Like mm. even if you're down and out, even if you lose everything, and I haven't put myself in that situation, but I've, I've spoken to people who have. Yeah. So never giving up means that it's not over. But if you, if you want to fix things or if you want to get better, ask for help. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. And thank you so much for sharing that story. A really important one tip for people to hear. And Phantom Media, tell us exactly what it does today and how can people find out more about it? Yeah, so we're actually in the, in the midst of our own exciting rebrand. So Phantom Media, the agency that I started back in 2006, uh, leading into the next 10 years for us is, has a slightly different look. So we're rebranding as Core 3 Brandwork. And that's Core because three, when I look say again, say again. Core 3 yeah. Brandworks. Core brand three, works, brand works. Core, yeah. core three. Okay. And, and it's, it's because when, when the recession hit and a lot of our revenue and a lot of our projects were tied to having boots on the ground, you know, we needed people in the cities. We needed people in offices. We need people on our client site. Suddenly COVID hit. We couldn't do that anymore. No. And I looked at, you know, the fact that we've produced thousands of projects with hundreds of some of the world's largest brands and coolest startups and world changing thought leaders. Mm -hmm. When I looked at, what was the through line between say like the most effective ad campaign versus a video or, or a landing page versus an email sequence or no matter what we were doing, like what was at the heart of what made our work special, unique, and different? I realized it came down to three core elements of a brand, which right. is really defining who you are, what you want, your objectives, your past, like the you, 
There's the them, which is the audience, the targets, you know, the, the communication, all of the things you need to do to segment to make sure that you connect with people the way that they want to be connected with. That's the yes. second core element. And the third is the marketplace or the, uh, or, or the competition. They, they have a say in it, what's going on. And so in the overlap of what's true to you and what your audience wants to hear or your targets want to hear and what your competition isn't saying or doing is that unique magic that we would put into our projects. And so what we do today is we help entrepreneurs, coaches, and consultants with their personal brands or their company brands, if they're a B2B, if they're a professional service, if they're an info mm -hmm. company, what we help them do is, is engineer their brand to become a strategic sales engine. So how can we leverage and get more clear? You know, people often say to me, like, I just don't know what's working or not working. Well, like we could take the guesswork out of marketing. Um, you know, uh, I, 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 there's a lot of interest, but, but people don't understand what I do. Well, we can, a lot, how, uh, we can add a lot more clarity to your message. Or, um, you know, there's, 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 I just don't differentiate myself that much from people, so I'm competing on price. Well, we could differentiate you against your competitors or in the marketplace, so that way you can increase your revenue and your profitability and your lifetime value of client. Like, like we are really strategic marketers because of all of the work we've done over this last 15, 16 years. Yes. But we've now just applied it to helping the entrepreneurs, the coaches, consultants, and their companies turn their brand into that sales engine so they show up looking the part saying the right things and making, most importantly, making people feel the way they need to feel to move through the sales process. Yeah. I think feeling is really, really important, more so than it has ever been. Yes. Um, so, yeah, 100%. Awesome. That is truly awesome. <laughs> and Mark, how can people connect with you, your team? What's the best way? Share all your socials, website, whatever you want. Well, depending on when you're listening to this, you just head over to Fanta.com. That's P-H-A-N-T-A.com. Uh, if you want to check out the podcast I host, We Do Hard Things, uh, you can head over to YouTube or your, I guess, local podcast audio app and look up We Do Hard Things with Mark Drager. We've had over 100 conversations with remarkable people like, uh, like Les Brown and Lisa Bilyeu and uh, just all kinds of some of the most amazing uh, athletes and business people and creatives. And if you want to connect with me directly, head over to Instagram, drop me a DM. My handle is at Mark Drager. Uh, I don't have a chat bot. I don't, I don't have a VA answering for me. It's really me. Uh, send me a message. Let me know a takeaway from this conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed listening to your, yeah, your journey, really. And I know the journey is continuing. And I know it's better, greater than it has been. Well done uh, with your family, with four children. That's fantastic. And I'm glad your mum's still there in the background supporting you too. Uh, really, really good. Um, is there anything else that we should have covered that you wanted to say? I, I'll just say, Michael, thank you, for the, thank you for what you do. I, I'm a content creator myself. So if you're listening to this podcast and you've been listening for you know, episode after episode, and you have not rated or reviewed this podcast yet. <laughs> maybe Michael might be too bashful to ask for it, or maybe he tags at the end with it. But I'm just going to say like, like send him a note, let him know your favorite story. Let him know something he said that's impacted you. Because often for those of us who create stuff, we're kind of just putting it out there. And sometimes, sometimes there's not a lot of feedback. And so those little messages light us up and keep us going. So Michael, thank you for what you're doing for this platform you've created. And most importantly, if you're listening and, and you love this content, rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> and the message to do that follows shortly. <laughs> Mark, and I'm so glad to talk to a fellow podcaster and your audio sound is just superb as well. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful journey, ongoing journey with your new business and your rebrand. Please stay in touch. I will. Thank you. Take care. Bye for now. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily 
by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.